And let's turn to Luke, the first chapter. Luke, the first chapter, verse 26, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph in the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind, troubled at his saying and cast in her mind. Very interesting. What manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I have never known a man? The angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow you. And therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. Well, you know that uh, the question came forth, and behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from and the angel departed from her. It's an interesting verse going down to verse forty five, and blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. I never weary of ministering from this portion of God's Word, and yet the Lord gave me some different insight than anything that I remember bringing, not only during the holiday season, but at any season. And as we look at these verses that are before us, it's really what I said a couple of weeks ago, how to receive the supernatural, but this morning I'm going further and I'm giving a title of the 2000 challenge is really what I'd like to minister for a while today. You see, in Luke chapter 1, there's a miracle in motion. Gabriel has appeared and declared the birth of the voice. His name was John the Baptist. And it came to pass. There was that miracle in motion. But then going further, we find the angel comes and appears to Mary here in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. I just looked for an excuse to get started on this again. The angel comes and appears to Mary and says four things that you need to know beyond the shadow of a doubt and believe them for 2,000. Here's what the angel said. Hail, you are highly favored. Now that word highly favored means greatly graced. So let's say it like this. Mary, you're highly favored. You're surrounded by great grace. The Lord is with you and you're supernaturally blessed. Now, I want to tell you the devil is hard-pressed to break through that kind of a shield. You don't hear this in the average religious church, but you will hear it in a church that will tell you the truth about God's Word because Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians says this over and over again in so many different ways, that we are highly favored. We're surrounded by the great grace of God. It's all grace, really, when you come down to it. The Lord is with you. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. And you're supremely blessed. And I know there are people that say, well, Pastor, you and your wife, you need a miracle in the life of your child. Well, we've received one miracle. The devil didn't kill her. In that respect, God had grace upon us in that moment. And you might say, well, when you're needing a miracle, how can you minister along these lines? I'll tell you what, you just keep the Word of God alive in your spirit. If you're financially pressed 
fill your spirit with what the Word of God says about finances. If you have great needs, fill your spirit with those verses. So folks, as we face the year that is before us, you need to get this down. I am highly favored. If it could be that everyone in this world didn't like you, God just loves you, period. We're highly favored. We're, we're surrounded by the great grace of God. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with me. And we're supremely blessed. Supernatural insights to enter the millennium that is before us. I mean, just all of a sudden, bam, one of the two highest ranking angels in heaven appears. And this message is given. Now, first of all, Mary did exactly what we do. I've gone there so many times. She went to her mind. And this sounds so simple, but please let the Spirit of God make this real. The 2,000 challenge is to get out of our mind and get into our spirit. God does not expect us to ignore our mind. That's not what I'm saying at all, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But so many people, even church people, are mind-driven. They're mind-driven. Just the last thought off the top of their head is what fills their conversation for that day or that week or whatever. Folks, the greatest challenge of my life, I don't know about your life, is to agree with God, to say what God has said. Now, that sounds easier than it is to do it, to think what God has said, to, by the grace of God, begin to live what God said. We're not just terrible, filthy, low-down, good-for-nothing sinners. We were that, and we can sin. But oh, the message of God's word is that we are forgiven, we are cleansed. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. The average believer's prayer is just, God, keep me on two feet. No prayer left over for souls or for their household salvation or the evangelization of the world. Folks, there's more than just us standing on two feet. God has already paid the price for us to have life and to have it more abundantly. Well, Mary was troubled in her mind. How many times have you been troubled in your mind? How many times have I been troubled in my mind? I mean, the last 30 days, there's been a lot going through my mind of the things that I know God has before us. And when I get into my mind and ignore spirit man, it becomes so impossible so quick. And I say like Mary, how shall it be? It ought to be, it should be, it's gonna help people when it is to be, but how shall it be? How can I do what God's called me to do? After all, he's the one that called me and he's the power to do it. But how shall it be? Mary went to her mind and when she went to her mind, the Bible said she was troubled. She was troubled in her mind. <laughs> well, I guess so. When the angel says, fear not, you're going to conceive in your womb. You're going to bring forth a son, and this woman has never even had a physical relationship with a man, much less her fiance. You'll call his name Jesus. He'll be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High, the Son of the Highest. The Lord shall give unto him the throne of David. He'll reign forever. No king has reigned forever. No king has ever reigned forever. You reign for a season, you reign for a time. And said, so There'll be no end of his kingdom. No wonder Mary said, how shall it be? I can understand that. I mean, I don't have a problem with, with what must have crossed into her mind. But I want to review this revelation, and let's look at it from God's point of view. I don't fault her for saying, how shall it be? But God begins to speak, and he said, Mary, here's the way it's going to be. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. Holy Ghost. And the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. And the thing that's going to happen for you is going to be supernatural. Folks, everything in our life is supernatural. Really? I mean, I thank God for the Red Sea, for the burning fiery furnace, and for the lion's den. But I wasn't there. But I was here, and I know how impossible this place was years ago. Totally impossible. 
Sometimes I just drive up and just make the circle around the church and just say, thank God for the faithfulness of God. God is a miracle working God. What I could not do, God was able to do, and God has done it. I was thinking the other day, $7 million canceled. Federal government canceled a $7 million loan and we bought our lower property back, eight acres back for $100,000. We sold it for $850,000. They kept it for 13 years, paid the taxes on it, and just kept flipping the loan until it was $7 million worth. And the federal government said, get it out of the files. It's, this loan is a disgrace. It's, and the Jewish Man said it's been a Jonah ever since we got a hold of this property. God did it. It's impossible for two rebels without a cause for God to save their life and turn them around, make anything out of their life. But God called two young rebels to be pastors. That doesn't show something to you about the grace of God. Man, we were anything but pastors when God called us, I'll tell you. I think the angels must come in, required a board meeting and said, God, I think you <laughs> went a little too far out on this one. Do you realize these two guys that you, <laughs> well, not really, but I think there could be some truth in that. But I want us to review this revelation. Gabriel appears with all of this life-changing thing that's going to happen in Mary's life. And I've asked God just to give me simple understanding. The biggest challenge we have, the 2,000 challenge, is to not be mind-driven but to be spirit-driven. The biggest challenge of 2,000 is not to be mind-driven but to be spirit-driven. Let me explain that. See, the first thing that happens, we go directly to the mind, and the mind says, no way, because the mind is not thinking the Word of God. You can't do that. You can't get there from here. But you see, when Mary went back to her spirit, then she said, be it unto me according to thy word, thy will. See, your head doesn't talk like that. Your head's full of reason. Your head's full of logic. It thinks. Your head will reason you out of a miracle of God. Your head will steal and kill and destroy everything that God has for you. Yes, your mind is important. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But you see, if we're going to see and receive and experience the supernatural, and when I say that, I'm not trying to be dramatic, but I'm telling you, everything in our life really is supernatural. Well, there's so many things in your life and my life, if I could have already done it, I would have done it. I'm just that human. We know how to do things to a certain degree. Well, the average church knows how to have church service if Jesus didn't show up for a number of years. But I don't know about you, but what we need in our household is supernatural. What I need in the church that I'm pastoring, we need some supernatural wisdom and breakthroughs in certain areas. And if I knew how to do it, I'd be like some of these church growth wizards, you know, They've got all the answers. They've never done it, but they've got all the answers. I'm not concerned about a church built by human manipulation. I want a church that's built upon the Word of God, a church that is powered by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So when it all is said and done, it will not be how great we are, but it will be how great God is. That's what it's all about. There's some things we can do to get that going in our life. If we're going to see and receive and experience the supernatural in our lives and our families, we must get out of our mind and into our spirit. How do you do that? You go to the Word of God. Let the Word of God be the final authority. We have a sign on Janet's door. It said, only the language of faith spoken here. The Word. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but God's Word will not pass away. Your human reasoning will say that child will never be saved. That grandson will never come to Jesus. But you get in your spirit and get in agreement with God, and God has promised us household salvation. You get into the Word. 
Well, there's a lot of people get into the Word. They're academically into the Word. But you've got to have faith in that Word. You've got to mix faith with the promises of God. It's a wonderful book, but it doesn't work except by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then there must be total dependence on the Holy Ghost, lest we're lifted up in pride. The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you, Mary. You see, Mary could only say yes to the supernatural when she got out of her mind, out of her human reasoning, out of the five senses, and into the Word, into faith in the Word, and total dependence upon the Holy Ghost. We keep doing this mind to spirit and spirit to mind, and we just keep playing this balancing game when, folks, it's not by might, it's not by power, it is by my spirit, saith the Lord. I know preachers that are so brilliant, it's scary. I admire their brilliance, but I don't like the track record. Give me somebody just a little bit more simple who just believes that God said what he meant and he meant what he said. The message may not have flawless delivery. It may not be the perfect type of presentation, but when you get through, you say the man believes what he preached. That God said what he meant and he meant what he said. Listen to me. It's God's will to bring you out of that dilemma. It's God's will to bring you out of that mess. It's God's will to pull things back into line. Don't settle for things as they are if they're not where they should be. Don't settle for it. Don't buy into that. God is a life changer. God is a child saver. God is a grandchild saver. God's able. God is able. You see, the moment Mary said yes, she got into her spirit. And her spirit, your spirit will always agree with the Word of God. Now, let me give you a case in point. Why do you feel so good about an anointed word in church? Because for that moment, your spirit is in line with the word. Man, I've heard people preach, I wanted to build something or tear it down. I mean, I wanted to fly to the moon if that's what we're supposed to do. Man, I've heard people, and I don't mean motivational speaking, I mean anointed ministry of the Word of God. You know, you get under the sound of the Word of God and you'll just believe you can do anything. But why is it you lose it on the way to the parking lot? Why is it we lose it on the freeway? Because we get back out and we say, what did I get so fired up about in church? What did I get so excited about? It seemed so right when they were talking about tithes and offerings, but, you know, I'm running pretty close here. I, I think I got a little carried away there. You see, Oh, people, this is it. This is it. We get out of our mind and back into our spirit and we say yes to the will of God. But we get out of our spirit and into our mind and we say, well, I don't know about that. I mean, that works for the super saints. That works for the preachers. That works for other people. But it doesn't work for us. My precious friend down here, they started and built a church where it was impossible to do it. 36 acres in Massachusetts, my friend. <laughs> I don't think any of you have a comprehension what that is all about. Paid for. And a church that seats whatever, 1,000, 1,500 people paid for. You see, God is an awesome God. See, the mind says it won't work in New England. The mind says it won't work on the mission field. My precious brother Wayne Myers is seeing stronger giving nowadays in third world nations than in affluent America. It's amazing. This man is the most truthful man I've ever known in my life. And I glory in hearing what God is doing. Because you can be a peasant, but if you believe the word of God, you're not going to stay there. 
And I'll tell you, there's people in third world nations that are breaking out of the fact you don't have to lie, cheat, and steal to make it. You don't have to con somebody. You don't have to do things the wrong way. You can just take your Bible and believe God. You can take your Bible and believe God. You can come out of the ghettos of New York. You can come out of the ghettos of any city. You can come out of the poorest nation or the poorest neighborhood, and God will make a way, not where there seems to be a way, but where there is no way. God's a way maker. I'll tell you, I've been crying out to God for a number of days. Lord, I didn't realize. You know, when I got into this message. I thought, boy, this is a great message. <laughs> this is wonderful. And God said, yeah, you need it too. That's the tough thing about preaching. You've got to practice. If you don't practice what you preach, you don't know how hard it can be as a preacher. You preach something and don't reach out in faith to practice what you're preaching, that thing will just blow up in your face. That's the only thing I don't like about preaching. I have to go out and practice it. You'd think God would excuse me from the exams, the final test, but I'm right there with you. I'm taking the test with you. Now, here's what I want to bring this down to. All the news isn't bad, thank God. Open the paper and they're talking about how terrible gas prices are and the worry of terrorist spreads. I'll tell you, our news media is doing a number on us nowadays. They don't always do us a service, but here on the front page of the Friday Star Telegram, December the 24th, it said a message we have heard on high. And this reporter said on Christmas Eve 1968, an enraptured world, including some misty-eyed reporters at Mission Control in Houston, received an unforgettable Christmas message from the moon. In the beginning came the voice from space. God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, nearly a quarter of a million miles, a quarter of a million miles from home, 70 miles above the moon's forbidding and lonely surface. Apollo 8 sent the world a Christmas present that will live as long as all mankind. Joy said they got out of the United States so they could say it. <laughs> it was 31 years ago tonight. A Christmas Eve message straight from the Bible and from the heart. As the crew members read in turn the first 10 verses of Genesis, their TV camera scanned the lifeless lunar desert and a hush fell over the men of mission control and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God bless those astronauts. God bless those astronauts. But wait a minute. Do you know why and how they were able to do that? No one knew what they were going to say from outer space. Those men read the first 10 verses of Genesis chapter 1. They didn't say, and Darwin said. They didn't say, and Confucius said, or Mohammed or whatever, and God. You know what these men were doing? They were in their spirit. Quarter of a million miles from home, 70 miles above the moon's surface. These men were speaking the Word of God. Don't you understand that this is old-fashioned? Don't you understand that's what men say? That book was written, you know, all the arguments. I say, thank God those astronauts said, we're going to say what God said. We're going to speak to the world what God has said. Thank God for them. You know, I really believe, you know, when you, when you honor the Word of God, I was, I was talking to Frida Lindsay or we were in a conference somewhere and she said, God, why have you been so good to me? There, that little lady, it's, it's just a miracle all that she's done. What a blessing she's been. And God says, because you've honored my Word, she reads the Bible through, I think it's twice a year. And God said, the reason I've blessed a little unknown lady who had a very famous husband and took the reins of a very troubled, financially troubled school and, and, and God's brought her through. She, God said, the reason I have honored you is because you honored my word. You have honored my word. Folks, 
you can read all the books, all the tapes, watch all the, the latest whatever, it still comes back to basics. It still comes back to prayer. It still comes back to the Word of God. It still comes back to you must be born again. It still comes back to total dependence upon the Holy Ghost. We don't get any sharper than that. You don't get any wiser than that. You say, but I'm a business person. Dear God of all people, you need what I'm telling you today. You can gain a fortune and lose it if it's not based on the Word of God. So Mary got out of her mind and into her spirit, and it was then and only then that she said yes to the will of God. Now, you say, now, well, Pastor, what about this brain that God gave us? Well, let me ask you two questions. What kind of mind do we have? And question number two, what kind of mind are we to have? What kind of a mind should we have? What kind of a mind do we have? And what kind of a mind should we have? And again, I want to say when God's Spirit, through the Word of God, rules our spirit, then we will truly have the mind of Christ. Now, I want you to notice quickly, I don't have time to dwell on it for a long time, but in Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. I want to show you what a mind that is spirit driven, not a spirit that is mind driven, can accomplish. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. In Luke chapter 10, verse 27, it said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. But he also said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. God wants our mind to be in line with the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, we're to daily confess. I know some people say, I don't believe in all this confession. Well, you confess everything else. You confess you have a bad car, crazy dog, mean husband, bad boss. You confess everything else. You might as well confess what the Word of God said. Daily confess, I have the mind of Christ. Words are important. Words are life or death, sickness or health. We have the mind of Christ according to 1 Corinthians 2.16. 2 Corinthians 8.12 speaks about a willing mind that says yes to God. A willing mind. You know what a willing mind is? A willing mind is a mind that says yes to the will of God. A willing child is a child that says yes to daddy or mother when they ask them to do something. A willing employee is one that says yes when they're asked to do something. A willing mind. In Philippians 2, 5, speaks of those who dare to be of one mind. You know, you got to remember, I thank God for the good side of church that I was raised in, but man, I saw, I saw things from soup to nuts over the years. And I mean, I can still hear them on the parking lot chewing up the preacher's message. Well, I don't know so much. Who do you think he is, you know? And, you know, just that old religious argumentative type. You wonder why they even came to church. It's the only fun they've got. Come and argue. But it speaks of these who have the mind of Christ and those who dare to be of one mind with other fellow believers. Now, we'll never agree on the perfect color, the perfect car, the perfect side of town to live in, whatever. You may like red, I may like blue. I'm just grieving, for instance. We'll never agree on those little things, but we can agree on the Word of God. You come up here and say, Pastor, this is what the Word of God says. I said, I agree. You, you have my agreement. No problem there. You see, those who dare to be of one mind with other fellow believers. See, that's, that's why a choir can sing and bless you because they're in one mind. That's why our staff, we have the most powerful staff we've ever had because we dare to be of one mind. When I win, they win. When they win, I win. When we both win, that's called a, whoo, that's called a tremendous breakthrough. That's the secret of a real New Testament church. Not one pulling this way and one pulling that way and one complaining and one gossiping. It's people coming because they found where God wants them to attend church. And they're so thrilled that they can be a part of it. They just walk around saying, yes, Lord, yes. Yes for that new gym. Yes for Uganda. Yes. Yes. Yes for the spirit of revival. Yes. I'm for what God is for. 
people who dare to be of one mind. The secret of the success of a New Testament church is those who dare to be of one mind. That's the way Nehemiah finished the wall. The people had a mind to work. Then Philippians 2, 5, those believers who daily and usually it's moment by moment make the faith decision to let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now you just lose your temper and just give somebody a piece of your mind. Remember there's not many pieces left. I'm going to let this mind be in me which was also in Christ Jesus. I wonder what, how we'd act if we had the mind of Christ totally. A blind man couldn't get away from us. He, his eyes would open. Lepers would be cleansed. Needs would be met. If we had the mind of Christ, we'd never walk away from a need that we could meet. If we had the mind of Christ, we would be an encourager. We would be a blesser. We would lift up the hands that hang down. That's the way the mind of Christ operates. The disciples said, let them go into the city. Tough. Boy, they were cold. Jesus said, give ye them to eat. You know why I want you to be prosperous, more prosperous than you've ever been before? So you can do what Joe and I are doing. We're doing more giving than we've ever done in our lifetime. Dear Lord, there was a time we were doing good to make it from one paycheck to another, suffering from friction, one back payment rubbing up against another one. Yeah, we've been there. We know what those times are all about. But thank God, thank God, the blessing of being blessed is that you can bless someone else. Someone said they died. How much did they leave? Some wise person said all of it. Because the only thing you're sending ahead is what you send ahead. It's the only thing you're going to say. Wayne Myers, if you just knew what a billion, triple, triple billionaire you and Martha are in heaven. <laughs> These people just a conduit that just flows through them. Just flows through them. I mean, the only missionary I ever know pledged $50,000 to a Bible school and it was paid before the year was over. Turn around and pledged another, I don't know, $100,000, $150,000 and that was paid. Man, you can learn something from a man's faith like that. You can learn something from a man's faith like that. Time we used to give a dollar and try to beat the check to the bank. Write a check for a dollar twenty-five, a dollar fifty, a dollar seventy-five. I know that seems funny to you now, but it wasn't funny to us. You get about three checks backed up like that, and you're paying more in check fees than you are for the offering you gave. Yeah, we've been there. We've been there. But now, thank God, ones turned into fives, and fives turned into tens, and tens turned into twenties, and twenties turned into fifties, and fifties turned into a hundred. Oh, glory to God. What a joy it is to write a thousand dollar check and just say, happy birthday, Jesus. <laughs> That's what being blessed is all about. Hoarders are the most miserable people on the face of the earth. Saw a man the other day, he's got four generators in the back of his pickup getting ready for the first of the year. When he runs out of gas, I don't know what he's going to do. But anyway, <laughs> notice this. Those who make the decision I'm going to let this mind be in me which was also in Christ Jesus. Well, you don't look like it, Pastor, but that's where you start. You start believing that. You start speaking that with your mouth. Well, they say when you get old, the first thing to go is your mind, and I guess I'm going. Man, you need that shovel and start digging six foot under for yourself right here. No, you don't need a shovel for the ground. You need a Bible for your heart and your spirit. And just say, I believe God said what he meant and meant what he said. Well, you know, just, you, just, you just can't raise children for God nowadays. Yeah, just keep overloading your mouth and everything you've got in your family tree will be serving the devil. I'm not trying to be, I don't have time to make it pretty this morning. Folks, it's time to see household salvation. It's time for sons and daughters to come back from the far country. It's time for grandsons and granddaughters to be set free by the power of God. God didn't give you that family to go to hell. God gave you that family to see them born again, spirit-filled, and on their way to heaven and be productive people while they're on the way. Well, one more, 2 Timothy 1, 7. You say, Brother Nichols, what happens to these people who let God keep them in perfect peace because their mind is stayed on him? 
What happens to those people that love God with all of their mind? What happened to those people that live from their spirit out, not their mind in, who daily confess, I have the mind of Christ? What about those folks that have a willing mind, that they're the yes people? They say, yes, Lord, yes. What about those people who dare to be of one mind with fellow believers? The secret of success in any enterprise. What about those believers who daily or minute by minute make that decision to let this mind be in me which was also in Christ Jesus? That's where 2 Timothy 1.7 comes in. These believers have a sound mind. You know, you don't meet many people that have a sound mind nowadays. I mean, I've never seen so many people on the edge in my life. I mean, from a pastoral point, from counseling, I mean, there's some challenging things that are walking the streets. And there's troubled people in everybody's church that are just that far from going over the edge. Some of you are here this morning. If you're not living according to the Word of God, you're living by fear, you're living by pressure, you're living by hate, you're giving, living by revenge, you're trying to get get even with everyone that's ever done anything against you in your life. You think you're getting even by not forgiving them and you're just digging your own grave in the process of it. I have one thing in mind, not to tickle your ears, but when we stand before the throne of grace that you can say, Pastor Bob Nichols gave me the Word of God. And I made my decision on a Sunday morning that I'm going to have the mind of Christ, but to have the mind of Christ, I can't be mind-driven. I've got to get into the Word and get my spirit into the Word. And then when something happens, I go to my spirit. I'm not going to be like Mary. I'm not going to be troubled in my mind. Everything that happens, I just, you just go up the wall, you know, just everything that happens, we just fall apart and come apart and fall apart and go apart. But when something happens, you say, wait a minute, what did God say about that? Wait a minute, what does the promise of God say about that? Wait a minute, what does the promise of God say about my body, my mind, my spirit, my family, my finances? What does God's word? You say, preacher, you don't know who I live with. Maybe best. But no matter what the challenges you may have at home, change comes from within. Change is inside out, not outside in. If you're waiting for everybody else to change, your bones will bleach in the desert. If you want to see change in your life, you start letting God change you on the inside. Let the fruits of the Spirit grow on the inside. Think like Jesus, talk like Jesus, live like Jesus. When the world squeezes you, let Jesus come out. you'll begin to realize the reality of 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I've purposed in my heart as I'm going into this new millennium, by the grace of God, I'm going to live it God's way. I'm going to think it God's way. I'm going to believe it God's way. I'm going to give it God's way. And if I don't know what to do, I'll just hush my mouth and just wait until God shows me what to do. Mary, <laughs> I'm going to tell you something that's going to be hard for you to believe. <laughs> and after the angel told Mary, she said, you're right. How shall it be? It's impossible. But the moment Mary got out of her mind, her troubled mind, and your mind can load up that quick. My mind can load up real quick. I don't know about your mind. My mind can load up real quick. I have to make this decision many times a day. Do I go to my spirit and agree with what the Word of God says? Or do I go to my mind and get in this mind, mind game, this mind battle? I see some young people really listening to me so close this morning. Young people, don't look at the failures. Don't look at those that didn't make it. Don't look at those who had a pretense but did not really possess the goods. You go to your Bible. Unfortunately, you can't follow the role model of everything in your life, some of you. But you go to the Bible and you see what God said. And you look at a Daniel and a Joseph and an Esther. And you look at those people who said God's word is going to be the supreme final authority in my life. And everything in life was against them. So big deal. But if God be for us, 
who can be against us. Young people, your Bible is the best friend you have. Read it, believe it. If you don't have a Bible, you can write in. Get a Bible, you can write in. Stand upon the Word of God. Some people say, how did you get started in the ministry? On my face before God with a legal pad and a ballpoint pen, crying out to God, God, reveal this thing to me a verse at a time and a chapter at a time. And God would give me messages. God would give me insights. I look at some of those guys we started preaching with. I mean, born preachers. They called them born preachers. Most of them have blown up and they're off the freeway today. But there's a few of us that knew that our future was in the prayer room. I said there's a few of us that knew that our future was in the prayer room. And so we'd get our Bibles and we'd go down to the prayer room in the men's dorm of Bible college. And we'd get on our face before God and we'd say, God, there was no sense in telling you how impossible it is. You know, but God, you're a big God. And I'll tell you, we'd walk out of that prayer room. Dear Lord, give me this mountain. Lo, God, expand my vision. Don't sit in your lazy boy and channel surf and ask God for more faith. Get the book out. Get in the book. Let the book get in you. And sometimes you'll spend a week or a month on one verse. One verse. And it becomes rhema in your spirit. And you can go anywhere and do anything as long as you believe God's word. As long as it's God's will and God's word for you. Father, I want to thank you this morning that you're teaching me and you're teaching all of us after all these years, how to more perfectly get back into our spirit. Lord, there's business deals to be made. There's decisions. There's employee decisions for so many to make here in this room today. Some are trying to figure out what to do about their education, what to do about the future, what to do about retirement, what to do, what to do, what to do. And God, we've worried with that thing so long, we're troubled in our mind. God, help us to go back to our spirit. Let us hear David that said, I've been young and now I'm old and I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor God's seed begging bread. Lord, give us the spirit of a Daniel that said, if I stop praying, I die. So I'll just keep on praying. Lord, give us the spirit of those three Hebrew young people that said, we will not bow. We will not bow our knee to this ungodly idol. Lord, give us the spirit of Joseph that said, I will not commit immorality. I cannot sin against God. God, give us the spirit of an Esther who said, maybe the purpose of my whole life was in this one moment that I've come to the kingdom for such an hour as this. Lord, we look at John the Baptist and Jesus died in their early 30s. And yet their mission in life was accomplished. It's not how long we live. It's accomplishing the mission that God has called us to accomplish in this life. It's what it's all about. I want you just to, with me, just look up to the Lord right now. God's speaking to some people. And would you just say what Mary said, Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. I don't know what that means to you, and you don't know what it means to me, but let's, let's just say that. Father, I'm just saying from the heart of Pastor Bob Nichols, be it unto me, be it unto my wife Joy, be it unto our daughters and my son-in-law, be it unto my grandchildren, be it unto the staff that works with me, be it unto this church, be it unto us according to thy word.